And I realized there was 11 heads there working on burritos. Hmm. Mike, you know, if it's necessary for them to have 11 people to be efficient in burrito construction, how many do I really need to be efficient in doing finance? Hello and welcome to Pillars of Wealth Creation, where we talk about creating financial success with a special focus on business and real estate. I'm your host, Todd Dexheimer. Now, let's get to it. Hey, we've got the North Star Real Estate Conference coming April 24th and 25th in Minneapolis. And this conference is going to be for everyone. We're covering the gamut of real estate. If you are just beginning, this conference is for you. If you have 100, 200, 500 units, this conference is for you. If you want to get into commercial real estate, this conference is for you. And the best part about the North Star Real Estate Conference is the networking. The networking is phenomenal. We've got high performers there. We've got amazing speakers and amazing attendees that are gonna be adding a ton of value to your business. We can't wait to see you there April 24th and 25th. Check it out, I'll see you there. Hello and welcome back to Pillars of Wealth Creation. I'm your host, Todd Dexhammer. With me today, I'm excited to have Aaron Chapman. Aaron, how are you doing today? Chapman, Todd, man. Thank you for letting me on. And things are great, especially now that I made it to this point in my day. Getting up here was, I don't know, man. That was, it was like, uh, it, it, was, it was madness all morning long. Yeah, that happens sometimes. We start the day with all intentions of having it be the most productive day we've ever had. And then it gets derailed and we feel like nothing has gotten done. Just chaos, mass chaos sometimes. Uh, so, hey, that happens, but we're here. Let's talk about uh, some business stuff and I'm excited to have you on. So give our listeners a little bit about your background and what you're doing today and then where you actually came from because I think that's a pretty interesting story as well. Oh, right on. Um, so what I do today, you know, I've, I've been in the conventional finance world uh, since 1997. So tw just a little over 22 years now. And what I had found was this niche in, the, in 2003 with the real estate investor and the mindset of the real estate investor being uh, kind of evolving away from that consumer. And uh, it, it became this thing where once we really understood the best way to work with the real estate investor, these last few years have been phenomenal. I did um, 103 transactions last year, uh, last month actually, uh, for real estate investors. And the all of last year was 723 transactions. Uh, the year before was 707. The year before that was 676. So we've been able to build a very, very amazing empire of business, if you will. And so then when you get into the, um, the history before that, I came from you know, working in the mines in New Mexico. I ran heavy equipment grew up on a cattle ranch, all these things that had, had, I had experienced in by breading my table with my hands and my back. And they shut down the project in Northern New Mexico where I had to uh, come back to look for a, a job. I couldn't find one. You know, I had a wife and an infant son. We were literally dead broke at this point. And when I was going to apply for this job, a $10 an hour truck driving job to haul landscape materials, my wife would give me a coupon for some diapers to pick up on the way back because we just didn't have cash for diapers for my son. And on the way, on, I went in to apply. I got the same response I got all over the place was I was overqualified. So they shot me down. <laughs> I went to my vehicle, pretty much a broken man at that point. Like I couldn't get a job to save my life. And I had an awesome resume. In this situation, the resume worked against me. Yeah. So as I'm leaving that place to find a grocery store, the gas light comes on on my truck. So I, you know, luckily the grocery store I went to had a gas station outside. I pulled up to the pump, ran my debit card. I got a decline. So I rummaged through my truck, found a few coins and I started walking that parking lot for two hours and I picked up enough change to get two gallons of gas. Back when the ga a gallon of gas was like 80 some odd cents. I went into the store, got the corresponding diapers. I checked out as I'm walking out, I come face to face with a guy who used to do all the dispatch and scheduling work at this company I used to dig swimming pools for a couple of years before. He asked how things were and I explained. Well, after that conversation, he invited me and my wife to dinner with a gift certificate he had for, to Red Lobster and he, he introduced me to this industry. He introduced me to a broker who took me on as a telemarketer that next week. And that's where it all started. And if it wasn't for the timing, right? And I think about all those things, we can what if ourselves to death. 
you know, I, if I didn't have that interaction, there's no way I would have stepped in this industry. It was a tough industry to get started in as a broker, as a telemarketer, and you're climbing your way up at 23 years old with nothing but a roughneck background. And then to now be ranked in the top 20 in the United States for transactions closed every year. Last year, I was ranked number 14. The year before that was number 12. So I mean, beat me a little bit. But it's, it's an amazing thing to consider that the, one of the biggest hardships in my life led to one of the greatest opportunities, but it wasn't just handed to me. I had to work my guts out for 22 years to get here. And every day I'm still pushing just because you're kicking ass and doing a ton of deals. But I found the more people that know you, the more people that trust you, the more people that count on you is the more people that will crucify you if you screw it up. So it's a really razor, a razor thin edge. So what are, what are some things you do to make sure that you don't screw it up? What are the th things you're implementing the people that are, are part of it? How, how are you making sure that you're continuing to grow versus, you know, being extinct? Well, it's a, it's a systems thing more than anything. Um, getting the right people in the right place. Cause we had to sort through people like crazy. Uh, once I started really finding a system, you know, I'd listened to a lot of the gurus in the mortgage industry. All these people are telling me what, what we should do and give me pointers. What I'm finding is the majority of people are giving pointers. They're not the successful ones. They're the ones that are the educators. It's kind of like those who do, who can't do, they teach. That's what I found within our industry. You know, it's not that these guys are bad leaders. They just didn't have the background on it, right? And some of them still kept doing it. did a good job that worked for them, but it didn't, might not work in my world. So I found myself in line at Chipotle, a uh, very, very long line back in 2014. And as in Arizona, you know how it is in the middle of summer in Arizona. I was kind of out the door. The door was still open. It was hot. And I finally got inside and it was this long line. But I was committed at that point. And as I stood there and waited for my turn, I started counting the heads behind the counter. It wasn't just the five people that was doing the actual front end burrito construction. It was all the people in the back and the manager walking around. And I realized there was 11 heads there working on burritos. Hmm. Mike, you know, if it's necessary for them to have 11 people to be efficient in burrito construction, how many do I really need to be efficient in doing finance? So I had one employee at the time, her name's Ellen Schmidt, who's still with me. She's my head of operations. She's been doing this since 1985. And I started to figure out how do I take what we've got and build a, an assembly line like process like Chipotle has. So now I literally have an assembly line like process with different people doing different stages. And it's the same people doing the same things over and over and over again. Very, very Henry Ford like to where now we have the capacity to handle 100 transactions in 18 days. Um, and what we have is not just me and a bunch of assistants or me and processors. I have the backing of a firm who has allowed me to not only build it the way most loan originators would, but then enhance it to where I have multiple processors, underwriters, funders, closers, and a customer service person on my team. I'm the only licensed loan originator. There's 300,000 people in the United States licensed to do what I do. But I'm the only guy that I know of that has an operations like that directly within his branch. And I'm the only producing member of, the, uh, of that team. So getting the systems in place were, were really, really a big thing. The other was making sure you have the right people. And getting people committed to the system and then also having them give immense amount of input on the growth of it. It wasn't something that's hundred percent dictatorship. I give them the, the latitude to say, here's the problem. Here's the goal we're, we're, we need to get to. How do we get there? And everybody has to spitball and come to consensus and buy into the system. And then on top of that, the people who don't want to buy in the system, the people who want to be individualized, they weed themselves out. I haven't had to let, no, I had to let a couple of people go, but for the most part, we've had about five people work their way out and they worked out on their own. It was really crazy was when they left, we jumped in production every single time. So come to find out that that was cog that didn't need to be in there. And it gave us an opportunity to refocus and adjust and, 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 and adding to the personnel where that person left a payroll gap to be able to enhance and improve the systems. So that's the best part of it is just great systems. Now I'm working on, on trying to figure out the best communication platform to convey the process to all parties involved outside of us because picking, you know, having to try and remember who to email every time is just, it's not, it's not easy. We got to get a better technology and I'm working on that now. Interesting. Yeah. So everybody's kind of on the same page. So right now you're saying one of the, one of the hardships is having all the people on your team 
emailing the right people and uh, communicating properly together as a whole. Is that, is that what I'm hearing? They communicate internally just fine. It's the external because you know to do 700 transactions a year, you don't get it from just one person. Yeah. Right. We're getting it from dozens of different sources. Well, they have their own systems mm-hmm. yeah. and different things that they want to see. So now it's a way of trying to figure out how do we communicate to all these people. And it's not is it the same people all the time in every deal. It could be, uh, and, and it's not going to be the same two people in every deal or the same three people. So now you got to figure out how do I incorporate three or four different people on each transaction who are not going to be related on other transactions. Gotcha. And it could be one off scenarios. So it's such an odd combination of folks that you have to work with. So it's, it's a, it's a really, really big task to figure out. I do have app builders right now working for me on an actual app that helps investors understand the real value of their real estate. Not the, not the pro formas, not the cash on cash return, not the cap rates, that is just a small metric. I'm talking about the real value, the hundreds of percent returns that's being built right now. And I'm going to try and figure out a way to incorporate this communication communication piece in with it as well. So you've got this app being built that's providing value to your investors, but what value does that provide then to you? Uh, it's really the more value I give to other people the greater value that they give back to me. I've noticed that the, the more I put the investor ahead of myself, well, it kind of goes back to the gold rush, right? You know, who was the, mo- the wealthiest people? Who came out as far as the wealthiest from the gold rush? Yeah, it wasn't, wasn't the people digging. No, it was the outfitters, right? The guys who provided the picks and shovels. Yeah. So what I'm doing is providing enhanced and better picks and shovels. And the difference is I'm not just slapping them on the ass and say, go have fun. I'm like, that's where the gold is. And here's all, this, all the tools to help you find the gold. I ain't got time to dig. I need you to go dig. I'm going to give you the best tools to dig. And then when you find it, you got to come back. You got to get more tools, right? They don't just need picks and shovels anymore. Now, now, now they need heavy equipment. They need trucks. They need a mill. They need a smelter. They need a full mining operation. Who's going to give it to them? Me. Because I have all that crap in the back. And if I'm sitting there just storing it because nobody's successful, I'm just stealing from them. But I'm actually losing money because I'm storing immense amounts of equipment. I'd rather have it deployed. So the better I can equip them for success and point them to success, the, the more successful I become. If they start to fail, I will eventually fail, and I refuse to participate in failure. So that, obviously that's one form of your marketing that you've got going on is that you are trying to provide a lot of value to investors, and in return, they – utilize your services they they come to you and then they need a loan uh, what other marketing because uh, to, to do seven what did you say 730 723 723 transactions in in a year i mean that's a, that's a lot of deals right uh, that's that's a lot of transactions you've got to somehow get people through the door you've got to somehow educate people you've got to get people to understand who you are so take take me from the start because obviously it didn't start that big take me from the start how, how were you able to build a reputation and, and to get people to come to you versus the other whatever you said 500 or whatever loan originators that there are so that kind of started off initially with um just in, in, in investors working their way back into Arizona after the crash. So I was working with them quite a bit before the crash. And then they started, you know, coming back in after the crash. And when they came in after, you know, they were looking for people to do the loans. And I happened to stumble into some folks that were buying uh, and rehabbing and flipping. And they were flipping to some of these groups. There was a, a large group coming in, one of these, um, you know, uh, these. Uh, the REITs. I don't know what the, what the call is. Yeah, it's kind of like a REIT, but they go nationally and, and go find the best places. And so I've got this one came in and they introduced me to these guys. And then they asked me to speak at some of their events. And then they had me get on some of their podcasts. And I started on the first podcast, I believe my very first one was like 2010 or 11. Didn't even um, know then podcast kept existed hand- at that time. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, it's something like I, I'd heard about them doing a podcast. I'm like, what the hell is a podcast? Yeah, right. It's just this recorded <laughs> thing. I'm like, how is that going to take off? I mean, yeah. that kind of seems like a waste of time, but I did it yeah. anyway because he was, he was doing it. So I did yeah. it. Then I had to start enhancing what I had to say. So I had to really dig deep and understand more about 
I had to educate people beyond, hey, here's your rate and here's how you qualify. Because any lender can talk about that. In fact, 90% of them still talk about that. If not 99.99, I'm the only one goes that I know of that goes beyond that. So it was, it was adding more to that. And then the other part was basically walking in there and being the un, underestimated guy, the unconventional conventional lender. So when I get invited to speak somewhere and if a person has never seen me face to face, they have a certain thing in their mind when they're being told that they're going to have a keynote or even an intro speaker, a speaker somewhere in the agenda that is a real estate investment banker that can understand real estate investments and help people with their finance. They have a picture in their mind. And it looks and just then like you. They'll see me. It precisely. Well, it should. <laughs> it should. If they, if they knew what was good for them. But yeah. I, I have all the time in the world to myself at these events up until the time I get introduced. So when I get introduced, they say, we have Aaron Chapman come up and I make my way to the stage. There has been people that's wandered around me all day and never, I mean, they kept a, a little bit of a distance, to be frank. Then I walk up on the stage and now they have one question in their mind. And the question is, what the F is that doing up there? And the benefit of that is they have to get the answer now. Because once they ask the question, they have to internally get the answer. So they pay very close attention. Now, there's a big risk here that if you're willing to take people from their mindset and flip it upside down visually, you better damn well bring some amazing content. Yeah. So I work my guts out to have really, really, really solid content for where the real value of the real estate is, the business structure, the getting the right team on board. You're the CEO of your real estate investment business. And if you don't have the best team members, you're literally going to fail. Then to the, to the real way to evaluate real estate as it relates to the taxable uh, benefits, uh, inflation, how it's paying it off for you, how you're growing hundreds of percent return and has nothing to do with cash on cash. Once I'm done with that conversation, believe me, I can't head to the bathroom without a crowd. So for those of you just listening and, and that can't see Aaron, he's a, a, a bigger, burlier dude. Looks like he could beat my ass uh, pretty good if he was that type <laughs> of guy. Uh, he's got a, uh, a beard, braided beard. It's got to be what, two feet long or so? Uh, they're, they're about, about yeah two two and a half feet now <laughs> two two and a half feet got a got a full got a full man face right uh, it d doesn't definitely doesn't have a baby face <laughs> going on and he's got a <laughs> he's got a uh, a steel uh you know chainsaw hat on you, you know definitely is not your traditional banker not the suit and tie clean shaven you know pretty boy uh type look um so those of you who can't see them, go on to YouTube because we'll post this on YouTube as well. And, and uh, you can see. It. Yeah. And you can go to my website and check it out as well. I'm sitting right there. And, and I think it's interesting. I have um, at least 13 or 14 of these shirts and half a dozen pairs of these pants, two pairs of these boots and eight of these hats. Cause <laughs> this is my, this, this is my uniform. I travel. It's easy to travel. Cause it's like, yep. is it, how many days am I going to be gone? That's how many shirts I get. That's how many said uh, pairs of pants I get. I don't have any of the other stuff. It makes my life easy. Simple. Yep. I like it. Hey, we've got the North star real estate conference coming April 24th and 25th in Minneapolis. And this conference is going to be for everyone. We're covering the gamut of real estate. If you are just beginning, this conference is for you. If you have a hundred, 200, 500, units this conference is for you if you want to get into commercial real estate this conference is for you and the best part about the north star real estate conference is the networking the networking is phenomenal we've got high performers there we've got amazing speakers and amazing attendees that are going to be adding a ton of value to your business we can't wait to see you there april 24th and 25th check it out i'll see you there Give us a mistake that uh, you've made along the way and how have you learned from it? How has it changed your business? Man, the question is what mistake? You know, yeah, I'd say the thing that is the greatest mistake I've ever made was getting cocky. You know, 2000, mm -hmm. yeah, the 2002 to 2007 was just, it was crazy what we were able to pull off. I was in my 20s. I was making a half a million dollars a year in my 20s, right? And I just thought, somebody told me when I first got in the industry, if you, if you start to, once you get in there about five years, and then it just continues to go up for there. I'm like, when I hit my five-year mark, it was a stupid amount of income. I'm like, 
can I, 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 this is where it starts. Like, this is where it just starts going from here. If you make it five years, this is, this is the floor. So I got really cocky with what I was doing. And I made, I, I remember saying and doing things that were just absolutely insane that I would even say and think that way. Mm. But it's amazing how when a person gets to that point, um, a header is coming. You're going to take a header in the concrete at some point. And what I've noticed about people, when you treat them in a certain way, they all can't wait to see that happen. Mm. You will draw a crowd because they want to see you take a beating. But when you treat them awesome and treat people very, very well and take care of them and you be a friend to all, when you take a header to the concrete, because it happens all the time, yeah. they're there to pick you up and dust you off, right? So that was, I, by the grace of God that I have some that were still willing to do that for me back in 2008. So on August 8th of 2008, I was heading out of town to clean my, clear my head. And I jumped on the Harley and 15 minutes into that ride, I was knocked off that bike at eight miles an hour by a, by a truck and uh, put me, shattered my legs, put me in, uh, in the hospital for several weeks, crushed rib cage, you name it. I was not mobile. I had to learn how to walk again. I, my memory was completely uh, wiped. I had a memory that only lasts three minutes. So I had to retrain wow. myself how to walk. I had to retrain my brain. I had to go back to a business that was obliterated. The sources that were sending me business had left the industry. There was only two left. My mom, who's still in the industry, an awesome realtor here in Arizona, and then another one from Caldwell Banker named Carolyn that had patients with me. They'd call me up, they'd give me a referral, and then they would call me back three minutes later and say, did you, did you call that person? Like, who are you talking about? Say, write it down. They coached me through every deal. So I started carrying a, po a pad and pen with me. And it took me about a year and a half before I started to be able to retain things that I would, that I would uh, short term again. I was able to write all down. I'd have notepads, stacks of notepads I carried. And that's where I got started, as I believe that I was blessed with the divine, inter divine gift and accelerated education. I took a beating over a year that was amazing. You know, 200. $2.7 million in medical bills. I lost, I was worth over 3 million according to paperwork, but it was obliterated by the grace of God. Did I keep my truck and did I keep my house? Everything else was gone. Investment properties taken. I remember signing away things on the wheelchair. My, my legs were taken from me. My income was taken from me. My, my lively, my, my assets, everything. And I get to start from scratch again. And it got me resilient because I had to start all over again a second time, actually two more times. In, in December of 2012, uh, I had to start over again because a company wiped me out and stopped doing investor loans. I had to start over from scratch. I got a partner in 2015 that we were kicking ass, and he uh, basically, almost like by cover of darkness, wiped me out, and I had to start over again from scratch again. But every single one of them, I'm like, if I can stand up from a wheelchair, I can stand up from this. And now it's just we're, we're bigger, better humbler and more powerful than I've ever been in my, my, uh, my life. And I found that things don't affect me near as much. I got some guys out in Missouri that have taken me for some money on some construction they're supposed to be doing, and they really put me in a bad spot. And I have the financial wherewithal to take those guys apart. But in reading, reading scripture, I study every morning at 430. I was reading a lot about the Beatitudes. Christ talks about, uh, you know, the blessed are the meek. And I realized what meek is. Meek is not being this weak person walking around taking a beating from everybody. It's a person who's a very powerful individual with resources that chooses not to exercise those resources against another or a person who has grace for another individual. And I read that at a time I was going to have my attorney go after these two people and just crush them because I was that angry about it. But then I had to remind myself when I acted like that before that the real person who got crushed was me. And I know for a fact that what was taken from me was minuscule compared to what's been continually given to me. You know, what I've got here is by no right should a person like I, like myself, have what I have. Be blessed what I've been blessed with. But the, the fact that everybody around me continues to do what they do and it benefits me as much as it has, that's a gift and it can be taken away any, any time. And I, and I don't take it lightly at all. So Aaron, what's one way that you, you, uh, you've been given all these gifts. What's one way that you give back? By spending a lot of my time going back to the whole, uh, giving great data to people, you know, having to get something better to present. I wake up every morning at four 30. I make my, I have a ritual. I make my way to my chair. Um, I do have prayer every morning and I did, I learned, learned a great lesson from, from two different contrasting uh, individuals on gratitude 
And I have a book coming out really, really soon that incorporates that into it. And I, I follow that practice. And then I study the material that I need to know to make people more successful. And so when it comes to, I think the, the thing that we can give more than anything to anybody is, is our time and to also approach the foot of God in, in, in somebody else's behalf. So I do that for everybody I send visit, that sends business to me, that does business with me, that works with me. Everybody that I have influence over, I spend time at the foot of God for them. And then I spend my morning getting more information that I can offer to them so they can think through what they're doing and hopefully make the best decision they can possible. You know, there's no saying that good judgment comes from experience and experience comes from bad judgment. That's not a way for a person to learn how to run a real estate investment business is to get that kind of experience. They, I would prefer that they learn from me taking what I've learned and then from all the thousands of people I've worked with and seen them make decisions and be able to offer that same practical data. So for me now, it's retention of good information, conveying of good information, and, and offering as much of my time as I can. Awesome. So for someone that's trying to get to that next level, trying to you know create something special like you've created, what like what are a couple of key factors, maybe two or three key things that, that they can do that's going to help them get there? Going to have, have, they, they've really got to dig deep and find out if they've got their balls attached or if they're for, there for decoration. Just to be completely blunt. Because if I had known how steep, how treacherous, how many poisonous serpents were on the trail I had to climb to get here, I wouldn't have taken it. Um, but they've got to be able to every single day decide that today they're going to keep going. Because the second you lay down, the whole world passes you. you got to take a beat and get right back up. Take a beat and get right back up. Everything I've noticed is every success has been just riddled with failure. And then I stand back up and I go, wait a minute, I'm further than where I, where I was before. So that's number one is just the resiliency. Just deciding you're doing it and just nonstop. Yeah. But then the second thing behind that is know exactly what's important about that because a lot of people say you know that you've heard the whole quitters never winners never quit but then you also hear well they, they got to know what to quit well that's what you got to decide what do you quit what is important what is not too often we get really suckered into that into in a um in a marketing ploy to get you to sign up for crap and go to this event and go be part of this mastermind and all that kind of stuff I have found, I've, I've been part of six masterminds in the past. And I, they were great. I got great information. I learned a lot of good things about really what it was, was just the push I needed to be ballsy enough to step forward and make that next step. I was holding back. I stepped forward and made that step. And literally, it started a domino effect of movement. Well, then I started also finding that everybody, there comes a point where you don't need it anymore. You know, I was one, part of this one where like, well, now we've got to do these accountability calls, accountability calls. And everybody needs to jump on every Thursday. I'm like, guys, the only person I'm really accountable is to me. I'm not accountable to them. They don't give a damn if I get up and do anything. You have these calls where they say, well, what's your reward if you do it? Who gives a damn what my reward is? My reward is me actually accomplishing something. And if I can't hold myself accountable, I can't get myself up off my bed, then I need to go find something else to do. Because when we really want to get down to it, we're alone in everything we do. I know my wife loves me, my kids love me, my mother loves me, my dad loves me, but they can't drag me out of bed and make me successful. Only I can make me successful. So if I can't wrap my head around that, I better find me some place where I work for somebody else in their hunting grounds and help them, help them clean their kill. Because if I'm not willing to be the hunter and I'm not willing to go out there and, and, and bread my table with what, and eat what I kill, then I need to go find someplace else to do. So those are the two biggest things in my world and if I, if a person doesn't have either one of those, they need to rethink what their goals are. Yeah. And that's so important because a lot of us, like you just said, you, you, the accountability partner and, and the accountability partners are, are great for if you, if you want that. And, but you have to be able to be self-driven. Like if you're, if you're not self-driven, if you can't get up and do it, it's like you said, it's not, it's, it's not for you. This is a tough road. Being an entrepreneur is not easy. It's not, uh, it's not for everyone and it's going to kick your butt. Uh, so you better be willing to, to get up and take that beating as you said, uh, and keep on moving along. So, oh yeah. And the greatest thing is the beatings are where the value is, man. Yeah. That's it. That's what I've noticed is I look back on it. That's where I got the best information in my yeah. life is getting my ass kicked. Yeah. 
Yep, hundred percent. Um, I got a couple more questions. We, we, we're going to have to wrap up soon, but I got a couple more questions before we do. Uh, what's a favorite book that you want to pass along to our listeners? Um, I have a lot of favorite books, but my absolute best, the book I read over and over again is the master key system by Charles Hamill. It is, um, I, I was first introduced when I started reading, I didn't start really reading until 2015. And I got really pushed into reading The Goal by Eli Goldratt. And that actually created a lot of my systems. A lot of the stuff I have in place that is counterintuitive to my industry came from that. The next was getting into Napoleon Hill's works. And if you haven't read Outwitting the Devil, that's also an amazing book. But uh, the master key system is literally the foundation for damn near everything that I do outside of scripture. Because it's amazing how much that parallels it. But if a person wants just a book that's, that's not considered religious, it's that. But in reality, it, 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 people calling them a religious text, they're not. That's the history of us, man. That's how we learn about us, where we came from, and how we get where we're going by looking at the history of people taking a beating. Yeah, yeah, so true, so true. But the one thing I'll caution with the Master Key System is don't just read it through. Follow the process. Have you ever read that book? I have not read that book. It's, it's definitely a book I'll put on my list. Okay, it, is, it, is a, it was a correspondence course created in 1910. So it's 24 chapters and it's literally 24 letters that go out. Or is it 27? I can't remember. I just go one at a time. You do one at a time every day for a week and every single day at the end of each chapter, you do the mental exercise associated with it. And then you go on to the next chapter once you've mastered that one. It mm -hmm. literally trains you on how to work your brain. Completely trains you how to, how to take control over your brain. You know, because if you've read, you know, the, you know, uh, Outwitting the Devil by Napoleon Hill, he talks about how, you know, a person being forced to drift is how we accomplish nothing. Yeah. So if you want to get control of your mind instead of drifting all day long and not being able to focus, start there. And that right there has been the best I've ever seen to be able to help me control my mind and focus on what I want to have happen. I started doing that in 2016. You know, that's where I started that. And from 2016, where things just started dominantly out of hand from, you know, I was achieving 300 transactions a year in 2016 by the skin of my ass. I doubled it to 676 the next year, 707 the next year, 723 this last year with 100 closed in 18 days in the last month of the year. And we're just getting started. We literally have found the foundation how to make this work. And I'd have, a, have dinner tonight with my team leaders to figure, okay, guys, we need to be prepared for the next run. How do we build it? And we're working on it. That's awesome. Um, and, and so important to be involving your, you know, I, you know, I like what you just said there. You're having dinner, you're involving your entire team and, and you're wanting to brainstorm ways to grow and be prepared and, um, you know, be ready for what's to come. What is to come? What are you trying to achieve? Where are you trying to take the business? So we're trying to really just get to the point where I'm my, my fullest or greatest and best use. My greatest and best use is not 100% looking at deals. It's making sure the team is, is visible, that the whole world knows this team exists. And the only way to do that is put a, put a bearded redneck on stage. That's why I have to do this. So I've got the YouTube channel I'm launching. I've got six books coming out. I've got all these things I'm doing. The app that I referenced earlier. Um, continue to be on podcasts, continue to keep expanding. But at the same time, when, if I can't be there to have that spitballing conversation with the real estate investor individually, I have to have people better and smarter than me at that. They may not be awesome marketers. They may not be able to get there to drag it in, but they can be amazing inside. And I've got it. My average person that's going to be sitting at that table tonight has got 30 years in the industry. And they have got a background of doing underwriting. They know how to put deals together. They help me spitball through problems. You know, and so having that team of people to take those things on while I go out there and get in the bulldozer and just pile them with business, now we got to get in the systems how to sift through that. So the deal is to take what I've got now built and build it into two. And then have two heads of those teams to take on what I do on the day-to-day plus another person who kind of manages all of it, which would be Ellen, the one that's been with me for over 10 years. And then I have uh, them just duplicate the process. Yeah. And then it, the, the goal is not to pit them against each other. This is not a competition. This is, this is basically, you know, where's five of us meeting at dinner, not six of us actually meet at dinner tonight. We got six oxen pulling one, one big wagon. Instead of having 
six individual oxen with six cart going different directions. We all need to go the same way. We just need to be able to pull a bigger wagon. We got ten. We've got eleven more people with us to make sure that that gets done. But I need to have the leaders on the on the right page first. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Really cool. Um, last question before we do a wrap here. Uh, what are your three pillars of wealth creation? So one is is my posterity. Bringing my children up is my number one to understand all of this. We have to have a family meeting once a month uh, and they got to show me what they're doing with their assets. Otherwise they will never have access to my assets from my past. So there's that. Uh, the, the other is I, I love the infinite banking strategy. I use that and real estate. So you now my pillars happen to be, you know, just the people around me. And, and I can put my team in that too, because they are the people around me. The other being that infinite banking, the life insurance policies and the places to, to rotate my capital through. And then of course, putting into into real estate. I mean, if that, if I, I could probably put those two together, the real estate and the infinite banking, because they both feed each other. So if we want to go into a third pillar, it's just my knowledge, making sure that my brain is continually fed with greater and greater data. And I never stop learning. Uh, and it, it doesn't have to be business text. You know, there's a lot of what would be considered religious text that I spend a lot of time in, at least three books at a time. Cool. Awesome. Well, Aaron, uh, tons of value you're able to add. I really appreciate it. Very impressive what you've been able to do and, and the story of going, you know, basically to, I mean, crazy that you were digging for quarters or chain, whatever spare change you could find, uh, you know, to, to put a, just a couple gallons of gas into your, into your vehicle from, you know, now being able to do 723 transactions in a year or so. Uh, really cool story. I definitely appreciate you uh, telling that. And how can our listeners get in touch with you, learn more about your company, uh, get the education that you provide, all that kind of stuff? The best is just go to AaronBChapman.com. A-A-R-O-N, B as in boy, C-H-A, P as in Paul, M-A-N. Um, and so when you get there, you actually see uh, me sitting on the porch of a, a cabin built in the 1800s. It's my office in Missouri. There's okay. a story about that whole thing up on the website that was created by me thinking and writing something down. I ended up with, it's just amazing how that stuff kind of stuff works, but yeah. that's the best place to go. They can see all the content we got there. We can schedule time to chat uh, through there. My assistant Samantha will set up a half hour of people we need to, I need to talk with to be sure that I block the whole world out and focus on them. Awesome. Well, Aaron, definitely appreciate it again. Thanks for, for joining us and you have a fantastic rest of the day. I appreciate you, Todd. Thank you very much. Hey, thanks so much for listening. I appreciate you being a loyal listener. Say, I would love to have you go on to our Facebook page and subscribe. Uh, give us a thumbs up. Go on to iTunes or wherever you listen and give us a rating and review. Don't forget to subscribe. But your rating and review just helps us push this out to more and more people and continue to grow our audience and hopefully positively affect a ton of people out there that really need this and, and want this. So uh, the other thing I've got for you is a free ebook on my website. So go on to VentureDProperties.com, VentureDProperties.com and download our free ebook uh, on real estate and on syndication. And I've got some data points in there, some really good stuff for you. So I'd love to have you take a look at that. It's free. I'm not expecting anything from it. Uh, and, and also look, if you want some help in multifamily, want some help learning, growing, getting your business off the ground, I would love to talk to you about what it would look like uh, to work with me potentially and see if that's a good fit. So you can go up to coachwithdex.com and check that out and uh, we can definitely have a, uh, a call. Thanks a lot for listening. You make it a fantastic rest of the day. I'll catch you on the next episode.